This is Father Bonaventure Chapman. And I'm Father Gregory Pine. Welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, podcast, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. Father Gregory Pine, how's it going? <laughs> I'm doing well. Um, yeah, by the time this episode airs, I will have traversed most Live. of my journey in the United States. Um, I came back to the U.S. on July 10th, visited with my family for a bit. I'm in the midst of said visit at this stage of the game. So I bopped in on a couple of nuns' monasteries, which was great, and then spent uh, a considerable amount of time with my family, which was also great. And um, yeah, we're at this stage gearing up for two God's planning retreats, which should mm -hmm. be good, unless they're not good, and then they won't be, but they still should be. And um, yeah, a couple of other cool things stateside before I head back to Switzerland in the middle of August. So uh, yeah, things are going well. How are you? I'm doing not doing bad. It's summertime. Um, and yeah, getting ready for this God's point. I suppose if they didn't go well, you won't hear this podcast because we'll have shut down <laughs> and been arrested or something. Um, <laughs> but I assume I assume things will be fine. Um, and yeah, it's 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 summertime um, and summer's. Summer's always, I don't know, summer's like weekends. I was talking to Father Patrick about this a while ago. Um, time. Uh, and <laughs> that summer's are like weekends, uh, which are super depressing for me. Like Friday nights were really great for me. And then uh, because it was like there was no pressure to enjoy yourself, because enjoying oneself has always been kind of tricky for me. Um, but then Saturday was like you need to enjoy yourself. And Sunday was like last chance to enjoy enjoy yourself before school starts again. And yeah. I, you know, so summer, summer and the start of it's okay because it's like, oh, no pressure. I could enjoy myself and things would be okay. But by now I feel like I'm supposed to be both working, which I'm, you know, doing all sorts of things as, as we didn't start talking about dissertation stuff. So, but don't worry, that's still happening. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but also like by July and August, you know, you think uh, you're supposed to actually like be enjoying yourself and that's, just, uh, you know, it's, it happens good to go. So it's, yeah, it's good. But, uh, and DC, summers in DC are an absolute nightmare. Um, mm. This place is, uh, it, it's a swamp. It's a total swamp. Mm. And uh, it's the time when you start sticking to your, to your, ha your habits, sticks to things when you're outside. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's less pleasant, I guess. But it's, it's, I guess it's big. We don't get too many snowstorms in the, in the winter. So, it, you know, half a dozen here, something the other place. Um <sighs> Yeah, so summer's going well. But the nice part about summer, um, to make a new, smooth transition, is summer's blockbuster movie uh, season, right? So, uh -huh. I mean, it's a time when you get to... In a sense, I've always felt like directors take a little bit of a, you know, take a break. Like, all right, we're not going to do difficult ones. We're just going to have, you know, real fist-pumping explosion ones. So, like, blockbusters, not in the sense of, like, Oscar. I doubt that many summer blockbusters also win Oscars. Um, so I think of like Independence Day, for instance, mm. is a classic one. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just good, you mm -hmm. know, regardless of Will Smith and slapping, it's just good. And, uh, but it's not going to win any awards, you know, but it's, it's fine. So summer is a time also to see, to, to get out and see movies, uh, sometimes, mm -hmm. especially since the, the, the theater might be air conditioned. I remember growing up and that was, that was a, a place that had air conditioning that you might go to. So do you associate summer with movies? <laughs> Well, I'd better associate summer with movies because if I don't, then that transition will have entirely failed. So certainly, <laughs> I associate summer with movies. I was just, I was in Berlin for a month learning German, and um, one Friday night, I just you know took my umbrella with me so that way it wouldn't rain, and uh, went down to the Potsdamer Platz and went to this movie theater where all movies were five ninety nine. That's euros, not dollars. But fortunately, the euro and the wow. dollar are basically equivalent at this stage of the game. And I saw Top Gun Maverick. And it felt like I was living in mid 1990s America. It was like this wave of nostalgia would just washed over me for how our country felt 25 years ago because it was, yeah, it was an incredible movie. So I left there elated, overjoyed, ecstatic, in fact, as I took public transportation back and met a guy in public transportation who ended up just saying that um, he, what, like came to know the Catholic Church through uh like american youtube stuff and he was being confirmed the next day i was like man this is awesome top gun maverick confirmation all in the same day 
How could the Lord wow. bless me more abundantly? Yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah. summer is a time for movies yes. and confirmations and good transitions. And good transitions. Um, and uh, to, the best transition of this is since it is a film episode with, and it's about a director, Denny Vill, Villeneuve, Villeneuve, um, New Village, I think, um, <laughs> who does not do summer blockbuster movies. Uh, <laughs> kind of. This is a man who actually makes serious movies, but they're good. They're, so, uh, Father Grade, I want to talk about uh, uh, Denny Villeneuve because he's um, he's one of the best directors I think, and we think uh, out there today, and just blockbuster after blockbuster in the traditional sense of i mean academy award winning stuff that's also not not super weird just mm. weird enough just that's his kind enough. of part of his stick so we thought we'd talk about so before we get into a particular a particular theme that I, I i think something about him that makes him so attractive at least to, to us or two themes uh maybe father Gregory, could you fill us in the background since you speak french um <laughs> Denis villeneuve uh came from quebec could you fill us in about just a a little about him about and about his uh what does he call it discography discography his, yeah, uh... his filmography yeah his oeuvre yeah um so yeah denis villeneuve is french canadian and he began his directing career with french films which is an industry but it's not as big of an industry as the american film industry or the english-speaking film industry more broadly so he switched over with the movie enemy and since then he's made what six or seven films ones that you may or may not have heard of. So Enemy had Jake Gyllenhaal in it. And then you have Prisoners with, again, Jake Gyllenhaal and uh, Hugh Jackman being the title. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, like his films just get a lot better known. So the ones that we would probably associate with him are Sicario and then Arrival, Blade Runner 2049, Dune, and the one that mm -hmm. I'm forgetting that Father Bonaventure is now going to supply. No, I think that's is that that's it? Dune Two is the other one. No, you're right. Six off the I don't know of any other. Those nice. are the ones that All I right. know that he did. Did not do Sicario Two. Um, did not so do Sicario like a... Two, so don't associate that with him. And you can yeah. tell the difference because the first one is an extended disquisition on the fra fragility of man, and the second one is about shooting people, as far as I can tell. Um, but yeah, so his he I mean he has a variety of inspirations, but as has become our won't you know like we're more interested in uh, following up with a, with a director who has like a thought to think and a, like a vision to communicate like a Wes Anderson or a Coen mm -hmm. brothers or a Christopher Nolan or a Terrence Malick or a, you know, Jordan Poole even, or, you know, blah, blah, blah. So this is the type of thing that we're interested in because he seems like he has certain ideas that he wants to communicate, but he doesn't communicate them as ideas on stilts. He's able to put them, you know, in living technicolor in a way that's really compelling and beautiful. So Denis Villeneuve, let's go. Yeah. He's, we we're, were talking about the themes of of him, and I think one of the interesting parts is to call him a, a cinema, cinemographic or uh, uh, Dostoevsky figure, right? As you know, a cinemographic Dostoevsky. Why? Because um, he he has an emphasis on the psychological. Uh, he he cares deeply about men thinking about themselves, men and women thinking about themselves, and coming to realization and that's what, I mean, so Dostoevsky's novels in their best, in their worst, it's a bunch of like running and jumping at each other. Um, and they're always flying at each other and all mm -hmm. these things. And, and there's lots going on and it's a little bit, but, and everyone is, everyone is way too transparent to themselves. Like there's the, no one exists in this kind of self. Everyone lives extremely examined lives. Um, even like small girls and poor people on the streets. Uh, so there, but Dostoevsky's point is that humanity is a psychological endeavor and he wants to tease out the 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 difficulties and the developments and the tensions uh, and the truth that we develop through our psychology and all of his characters are although transparent extremely robust and detailed and beautiful they're well thought out there, there's no there's no like standing in kind of characters they're all well developed and yet dostoevsky's brilliant because it doesn't it doesn't slow the narrative it's not like we're focusing on individual thought, but actually, they still feel like there's a story. I think in cinematography, um, Vil Denis Villeneuve does something similar. His his characters in his films are very rich psychologically, which is harder, I think, in film to to do in some ways than than writing because writing you're already in your mind, kind of it's your think you're reading on the page, but you're creating it in your mind all of this. So you're already in like a psychological mode. But in, in film, 
you're kind of passive to the shapes on the screen in a sense, and it's more objective. And that was, you're already a little bit distant from the psychology. And yet uh, Villeneuve brings up these, these rich psychological insights on the film. His characters are acting out such that you can see their kind of thinking and their personal development and their reflection in, in who they are, uh, identity, all this part of the issues. So I think the Dostoevsky in parallel seems he's like a French Canadian Dostoevsky on film, which, and, and does it profoundly, yeah, doesn't it profound and, and impressive way that doesn't destroy the narrative. So you don't watch his movies for just, for just character development and psychological point. They have a story and they're still driven and they, you're still drawn along, but it's with real human beings. That's my, uh, the psychological theme there is, is very, is extremely rich with him. Yeah, I just um, read a book by Kazuo Ishiguro, who I met, we're going to have an episode on sometime in the next 7,000 years, um, oh, yeah. called the, the Unconsoled. And we've talked previously, Father Bonavich, you and I have talked previously, although we haven't talked about it on this particular podcast, about how Kazuo Ishiguro has a way of generating dread, slow, terrible step by slow, terrible step. And the book that I just read, The Unconsoled, reads effectively like like a nightmare. It's like he finds himself in a particular place. He doesn't know how he got there. Time stretches and kind of distends almost in weird ways. And then he has to account for the fact that he's standing before a group of people whom he's to address on some music, musicological theme, you know, but he's wearing his dressing gown. And it's just like so weird, such a weird book. Um, but I would say the 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 first two English speaking movies that he did. Mm -hmm. So namely Enemy and Prisoners, neither of which I think I can, I, I don't think I can recommend Enemy for reasons of content and Prisoners, mm -hmm. if you're sensitive, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and uh, in both of those movies, you have yeah a kind of weird nightmarish quality to the film, because it's not so much that like time stretches or distends as it is that you feel like you're getting, what would you say, like messed with almost a little bit. In the way that like when you watch Shutter Island and you're like, yeah, I sympathize with this mm -hmm. guy. I sympathize with this guy. I sympathize. Oh, no. Um, so, too, when you watch those movies, you're like, yeah, these are these are believable people. These are sympathetic people. These are. And then it's like, you know, a kind of Nabokov move where, in fact, the narrator is unreliable and you're in real bad shape. Um, so he has a way of communicating, you know, like existential angst or interpersonal division in ways that bring you along, but kind of mess with you interiorly to the point where you arrive at the end, you're like, oh my gosh, you're astonished. Um, you're, you're grateful that you've been led through the cinematic experience, but you also feel a little bit beaten up like this. <laughs> oh my gosh, this just happened. So I appreciate it for that reason. And I do find that to be very Dostoevsky because, you know, think about Crime and Punishment, which would probably be the easiest of his big books to read because it seems like it's actually a story rather than an extended psychological experiment and experiment punishment. Um, paradoxically. Yeah, in, in that book, you just kind of get led through his craziness. And you yourself kind of go a little bit crazy as you read. You know, you, you sympathize with his madness to such an extent that you lose your grips. And uh, I think that Villeneuve is able to do something, something similar, but within the limits of his genre and medium. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a psychological painting, I would say, uh, with, with a moving painting, a psychological movie, I don't know, whatever. Um, and <laughs> um, also something that's, it's not, I think this is, this is important too, before we get to kind of get to particular themes, talk about uh, particular movies, break them down a little bit, is uh, the aesthetic quality. His, he's won a number, his films have won a number of Oscars. Uh, and Almost each the the big ones that you know about, so Arrival and Blade Runner and Dune, um, it's cinematography that they that they kind of win on because uh, uh, they're good otherwise. But they're beautiful movies. There's something about the way he sets the scene. He's able to to really paint things such that even landscapes have uh, a quality to them that's revelatory about the meaning, uh, the reflection on on where you are and the discombobulation, you could say, or the tensions that need to be resolved. I think there's, they're, they're absolutely beautiful and not just a few scenes, but like every scene, every scene. So I think of, um, almost swing to this now, but one of my favorite is Blade Runner 2049. So this is the sequel you could say to, uh, to Blade Runner, the original movie. Um, and the, 
the the graphics are gorgeous. They're absolutely gorgeous. And it's not a gorgeous place. Uh, this isn't a, a hellscape. You know, this is in the future, apocalyptic kind of stuff. And everything's dark and and but and quiet and burnt out. So it's post apocalyptic stuff. But it's it's a rich. It's it's like a it's a yeah a, a rich and full embodied pokes apocalyptic you know area and he does it by colors by shading i think you'd have to ask a a real a real artist to to be able to explain exactly how i just know it does have this effect of drawing one in to to the the, the space such that you feel emotionally related to these spaces and uh, and when they're when that's everything's dead you feel like you're you're alone um, but then when in the cities it gets across the kind of crassness to them without without being over the top it's very it's it's it, there's a delicate touch you would say it's like a, a a not a pastel but kind of an airbrush technique um that's that's i think is fantastic but um let me talk about uh my well, i'll talk about blade runner just stay on this for a minute um if you've seen the original blade runner it's 1982 uh and um, it's with Harrison Ford. It's based off of a movie, a book by Philip K. Dick called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? It's one of those cases where the movie is better than the book. Um, and the book's not bad. It's just really weird. It's Philip K. Dick. Um, but it, the, and if you saw the movie and you read the book, you would not be quite clear on this being the same thing because the issues are so different. But uh, Rutger Howard's in the original one, Harrison Ford, of course, a number of actors, um, Edward James Olmos. And it's a dystopian thing, and it's one of those classic. It's if you ask someone like, "What's postmodernity?" You just have them watch Blade Runner because uh, it's everything's discombobulated. There's certain points where there's little midget um, robot things uh, that are just gibbering, and you're not you can hear them, but you don't know what they're speaking. You're not supposed to know what they're speaking. No one lives in a consistent frame of of reference. Everyone's just like kind of overlapping their 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 stories and narratives. Uh, and the biggest question about it is 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 me is identity uh because the question of what it means to be human what it means to be human uh because of course the whole story uh deckard the uh harrison ford character is trying to retire replicants so he's a blade runner which is someone who retires takes out old robots that have gone that have gone astray and uh the question is at some point whether deckard is actually a replicant himself uh or whether he's not and the movie is ambiguous about this ridley scott uh, the book is not as ambiguous about it, uh, but the movie is ambiguous about it. It's beautiful. Uh, so it's a question about what it means to be human. Uh, and it's and in some ways, the the idea is one of the replicants is supposed to be more human than he is and what have you. Well, 2049 is brilliant because most sequels are garbage. A Weekend of Bernie's 2, for instance, just does not live up to Weekend of Bernie's. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Blade Runner 29 uh, is is better I think than Blade Runner, and that's hard because Blade Runner is my favorite movie. Uh, but Blade Runner twenty nine, you can't have Blade Runner twenty forty nine without it. It's like Dark Knight versus Batman Returns, I suppose, or it begins. Um, but uh, it's it's better in that it does the same thing as Blade Runner was trying to do. So dealing with that question of humanity is a psychological question. What does it what does it mean to have a psyche? You know, can machines have this, or do we have this? Is there something? Is a psyche emotionally related, or is it just purely intellectual? Um, and so it asks the question about about who is who is human or not, because um, the the lead character K, uh, played by played by Ryan Gosling, who actually this first movie I actually saw him, and I said, I actually you're not a bad actor. Um, and he's actually we know he's a replicant at the start, so he's a Blade Runner, he's a re replicant retiring replicants. Um, but halfway through the movie, it switch. You start to think maybe he's actually human. So it's the it's the reverse of the original Blade Runner, uh, done extremely well, taken from the other angle. Like maybe instead of going, maybe I'm a robot. It's maybe robots are human, which is what Blade Runner is about. And then adds to a second dimension of it, makes a total hologram. So a hologram played by oh I forget how to pronounce her name. She's gorgeous, uh, Ana de Armas, I think. Um. She is just a hologram. She's not even a replicant. She's a hologram. And she ends up being, in some ways, more human than a lot of the humans in it. So it's like, I'll raise you the question of identity of, of, of the psyche of robots and what have you, and raise that question. And then I'll go even further. I won't even have a, this one won't even have a skin. It'll just be a pure hologram, and it'll be more human. It reminds one of, uh, of um, oh, what's Interstellar, where the two robots 
uh, Cass and Tars are are just blocks, but because they have sarcasm, they're the most human robots I've ever experienced in a movie. Um, so Blade Runner twenty four nine raises the question about identity, and he does this in such a a, a profound way, and a uh, the reverse of the original Blade Runner, and then the second is adding that second dimension to it. And I won't give away anything about who's actually human in, in this sort of thing. You really ought to see it, except for once. There's some, there's, a, there's an unnecessary scene at one point, um, but it's it is it is well done. So that's that's brilliant to be able to take a sequel and make it the same what the original one, not by repeating it, but like giving it a new twist and then adding a second layer, saying you know what the original was good, but I'm going to go even further on this. That that's a bold stroke. Yeah. I think that what you see in art, well, what you see in art is a communication of a certain vision, but what it registers in our lives as often enough is like the opera, the opera, oh my gosh, I'm going to struggle to say this, Operatic. Word. operationalization, woof, oh. operationalization of a question. And I think the baseline question is, what does it mean to be human, right? And I think that mm -hmm. that can be posed in a variety of different directions, like who am I with regard to God or who is God before me? Um, but like often we're asking like, what do we as human beings do and what does that reflect about our nature? And so, you know, he has one way of doing that in Blade Runner 2049 and you see other ways of doing that in his other movies. Mm -hmm. And I think specifically, um, you know, with respect to Arrival, it's the whole, the whole movie is shaped around questions of communication, conceptuality, language, et cetera. So some people have said it's an extended kind of exploration of the Sapir Whorf theory, which is, uh, like how you think or how you conceptualize um, is in fact related to or dependent upon how your language works. And so there are these humans, they're in conversation with these aliens and uh, these aliens think and communicate differently. So they're trying to crack the code of their language so that way they can gain access to the information. But what they come to discover is in cracking the code of the language, they gain access to a world beyond, which is a world which is very profoundly humanizing. It's not alienizing, it's in fact humanizing. And I think Maybe just apropos of what you described with Blade Runner 2049, it's fascinating that Arrival is framed by a mother's love, you know, like so a mother's care, concern, and love for her child. So the opening scene, you see the title character, Amy Adams. This doesn't give anything away because it's literally the first minute or two. Uh, you see her with her young daughter who grows, you know, up to be maybe like 16 years old, and then she, con she contracts a terminal illness, and then she dies. And you see that all just in the first two minutes of the movie. And then it leads into the present narrative with rain falling outside the home where you saw her and her child, you know, over the course of the first however many years of the child's life. And so this whole question of communication, language, etc., is framed in the context of, yeah, just like a very sad story of human love and human loss. And so it has a way of like, it's, it, this is not a philosophical experiment, right? This is urgent. This is dire. This is very serious indeed, precisely because this is the very, what would you say? Like, this is the very substance of human communication. Um, and uh, yeah, I just love the way that he's able to do that. And then that brings you, yeah, it brings you before these questions with, um, yeah, with a particular emphasis mm -hmm. or kind of with a particular disposition to receive the answers that he's able to proffer and not proffer in a didactic way, but to kind of show to you or lead you through. Yeah, they're they're deeply, um, they're moral films without being moralizing. Uh, I think that's the they're asking deep questions about what it means to be human and what you ought to do as a human. So the Arrival specifically, the problem with Arrival is, um, as if you haven't seen it, we can't we can't really talk about the whole issue because there's it has this incredible turn to it that makes a profound difference and the which is the point of the the movie. It's really about providence, you could say, uh, mm. and and one's decisions about embracing uh, life regardless regardless um and the other thing though is a beautiful part about arrival is as you said it's it's got this science fiction quality to it and it's got this but it's not an experiment you could say oh he's doing he's because he's doing time travel so it allows it allows for time travel in here and some people just this blows their mind um they just whenever they see time travel they freak out but i'm as long as you let me know what you're doing i'm fine with it because it gets into questions about it allows you to ask questions about like human identity in ways you couldn't, because if you didn't have time travel, you couldn't ask questions about like changing the past, this kind of stuff. And he does it through through the Sefer Wharf thesis on language, which is profound, which is interesting, and that's new. And you could think, oh, the movie was about that, but as Father Gregory said, it's not about that. It's about being a human and deciding how you relate to to those you love, 
uh, and what you ought to do and how you grow in that. And so the mechanism, the, the, all the mechanism, the pyrotechnics, you could say, are at the service of a very human issue, a very human concern about what we ought to do and who we are. And that's true for so many of his movies is that they are, they're gorgeous aesthetically, they're complicated themes, uh, they, are, they are impressive, impressive narratives, impressive sets, uh, everything, you know, like Sicario, for instance, that's an action movie in a way. But the action movie serves the purpose of asking the question of, of what is real and who innocence and, and guilt and uh, difficulty, compl uh, complicitness, the dirty, moral dirty hands question, all these kind of things. Are at the, so the, all the, the mechanisms and the narrative and all the action is at the, is at the a question of aiming at the question of, of deeper psychological issues. And that's that's the he could just get away with saying I'm a great like Christopher Nolan in a sense does great stuff technically, but his, his characters don't have the depth I find, uh, in a lot of them in the way that uh, Villeneuve's characters do. But it still has the same kind of playing around with big philosophical and pyrotechnical aspects. Yeah, no, for uh, for any number of reasons, I think that he has peculiar insights. And I think that his peculiar insights are at the service of the communication of a very human truth. Yeah, maybe just a final thought on Sicario is, mm -hmm. yeah, you find here, you know, a kind of strange rug pulled out from underneath your feet, which you didn't realize was a rug. Um, but that, you know, some problems may not have a good solution. And yet we find ourselves plunged into them. And then it's a matter of kind of how we extricate ourselves from those problems. And sometimes we're made to confront the fact that it's not going to look like I wish it could look like. <laughs> um, but then you see like what that does to the human spirit. Like some are hardened by it. Some are broken by it. Some pass through it as they pass through fire and water. And um, yeah, it leads us to kind of question our own experience and the things through which we've passed. And it's like you feel the weight of your ruined humanity because though we say a variety of things in the context of Christian preaching about the abundant life and how God wills it for us, we also recognize the fact that our bodies are breaking down. And in a certain sense, our spirits are breaking down while they are being renewed. Uh, they're also kind of breaking down a little bit. Like we're not able to marshal the same discipline. We're not able to marshal the same courage. We're not able to marshal the same energy, period. Right. And then you look at like the different forms of ruined humanity in that novel or excuse me, in that movie. And you have to confront the way in which it's, yeah, the way in which it's true of you or of those whom you mm. know and love. And that's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's bracing. Yeah, I think that's that's such a great um, thing to think about. He he's a he's an astute student of fall of the fallen human world. We could think of just the fallen world as stuff just breaking down and kind of tragedy and disappointment and all of that and sinfulness, whatever. But it's not just the fallen world that's there, the brokenness. But it's the fallen human world. There's still this aspect, which I assume is a touch point to the incarnation, that that humanity is still. There's still a part that God can incarnate and 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 work in and redeem because of because of how He made it in His image and likeness and comes in, in Christ. Um, there's still there's still a, a possibility of communication, divine and human, and so it's a fallen human world in the sense that there are these that even the f most fallen characters are still human uh, and have a mo have opportunities to see. There's the sense of there's goodness and potential and possibilities that you're open to. So he's a yeah he's he's a painter he's a painter of the fallen human world and I think it's easy for us to th easy for us to think about just the fallen world or about the human world and not keep them together uh, but he does such a great job of that it's 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 marvelous just to mention we'll have to and of course we didn't get to talk really about Dune um, but Dune is a two parter so maybe we'll do one on, on that the most most ambitious attempt I mean this is a man again who doesn't fool around. He takes on Blade Runner, which is one of the most impressive movies in, in history, and says, I'm gonna raise I'm gonna raise the ante a bit. Dune is one, a gigantic, sprawling book of utter confusion and that is just brilliant. Uh but it also has a cinematography. So <laughs> David Lynch attempted to do to make Dune. And I love David Lynch's Dune. It is nuts though. It is absolutely weird and and crazy. And you'd think there's no way to compete with that because Part of the great part of David Lynch's Dune is it's, it just fails miserably to, to do make Dune. It just does its own. It's just incredible. Um, 
And Vilnu says, nah, I'm going to go for it. I've got skills. I've got skill sets here. Um, I can do Fallen World, even with giant sandworms. Um, and again, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, but again, the characters. So it's, it's not only beautiful, it's not only character development, it's the psychological aspects of this boy growing and, and coming to understand his identity, relationships, mothers, mothers, sons, fathers, sons. Profound, profound, profound. Um, and also with giant sandworm and then fighting and bizarre rituals. Oh, it's, it's just, it's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The sound, everything's great about it. We're looking forward to this second one. It leaves also, it actually like cuts it off at a decent point that you could, you could say this is a hole, but it's a part of a hole that's bigger than that hole. So uh, I, I assume we'll have to do a, Dune, a full Dune episode at some point to talk about the issues in there um, because they are they're spectacular. But um, summertime, movies, if you, uh, it's a good time to go out and you can find some air condition and see a not a, well, watch a villain new movie if you haven't, um, sort of thing. Maybe a, maybe a rival or Sicario, but he's also, he's not for the faint of heart, you could say. Um, but he's, uh, he's, he's excellent and although maybe not a summer, a summer movie kind of mood. Okay. So thanks again to all our supporters. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like, subscribe, leave a five-star review, uh, any comments, this sort of thing. Visit godsplaining.org to shop our merch and get dates and information about upcoming Godsplaining events. Again, please pray for us as we'll be praying for you. <laughs>